Imagine that you received a letter in the mail this week with no return address at all, so you had no idea who it was from. Imagine then that you tore it open and found inside a handwritten note that turned out to be very disturbing. The note said, I am following you. You won't see me, but I'm there all the time. I see you wherever you are and wherever you go. I will always be close. Maybe you'll even feel me near you, even though you can't see me. You can't shake me or lose me. You'll never get away from me. I'm, re I'm right behind you all the time. Wow, that would be a pretty disturbing, disconcerting note, wouldn't it? Have you ever been followed? I remember when I was just a kid walking to school with a couple of my friends and glancing back over our heads, we saw that the greatly feared school bully was about 50 yards back and gaining on us. He was surrounded by four or five of his gang member mini bully friends. Were they following us? What were they going to do to us? It was scary. Maybe sometime you've been walking alone in the woods as it was beginning to get dusk or dark. And you heard something behind you, stopped and listened, nothing, started to walk, heard it again, and you began to think, something is following me. In your mind, you conjured up a cougar or a bear or a, a wolf stalking you and ready to pounce on you. Scary, right? Maybe you spotted a state police car driving behind you on the highway. And almost instinctively, you glanced down at your speedometer and realized that you'd been speeding. You kept glancing in the rearview mirror to see if that patrol car was still following and could feel your heart beginning to beat a little harder as you wondered when his light was going to go on and he'd pull you over and give you an expensive ticket. Maybe you started to uh, pass someone driving on I-96 and and suddenly heard a blare of a horn and realized that you hadn't checked your blind spot well enough in the mirror and you quickly jerked back into your lane. The person you had cut off pulled up beside you and turned and looked at you with a livid anger in his face and gave you a, a hand motion with his fingers to let him know he was really upset with you. And then he pulled behind you and rode your bumper dangerously close, just a few feet, for several miles. As your pulse began to race, all you could think about was some of the news items you'd seen about terrible things, violence that happened because of road rage on the highway. And there he was, following you. Scary, right? <laughs> on the other hand, maybe you had car trouble sometime, and a family member or friend said, hey, I'm going to follow you in my car all the way to your house just to make sure that you get there safely. Hey, that's a good way to be followed, right? Maybe you were going to go to a restaurant to eat with a friend or, or, or family member, and they didn't know where it was. So they said, well, tell you what, I'll follow you in my car, and then I'll get there safely, and we'll have a wonderful meal and a great time together. That's a good way to be followed. Maybe your family was going to take a trip to together, but you wouldn't all fit into one car. So you packed into two, and the other carload of your family members followed you. It went had a great feeling to look in your rearview mirror and see there's your family following you, uh, looking forward to a wonderful time together. Perhaps you have a great friend, and, and they told you that they were going to be figuratively following you. Maybe you're going through a really tough time, experiencing some pain, and they said, don't worry, I've got your back. I'll be right here. I'll stand up for you. <laughs> yeah, they were following you, weren't they? They had your back, and that was a really good way. You know, when someone is following you, it can either be frightening or comforting. That's what I thought of when I was reading Psalm 23, everybody's favorite Old Testament psalm. We've been studying this ancient Jewish poem written by King David, reflecting back in his days as a teenager, shepherding his father's sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. That's the first verse. And now we've come to the final verse in this wonderful 
wonderful psalm. Verse 6. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Originally, I wanted to cover that whole final verse in this time on video today, but I began to realize that it would be much too long a sermon, especially on video, so I'm going to cut it in half, and today we'll unpack just that first line, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday, we'll look at the last line of the, of the psalm, I will dwell, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. David knew what it was to be followed by someone or something that was scary and dangerous. You remember when he was a teenage shepherd for his father's sheep, there were times that his flock was attacked by a lion or a bear, perhaps other times that he doesn't write about by a thief. But David followed the sheep, and as he followed them, uh, he was there to protect them and keep them safe. Years, but he knew what it was to be followed by something scary and dangerous. Years later, as king, later in his life, he knew what it was to be followed by those who would harm him. Remember, before he was king, King Saul, and later his betraying son Absalom became the king, and both of them, in those separate times, led their armies to follow David and kill him. Can you imagine what it would be like to have a whole army following you, intent on finding you and killing you on the spot? But here in Psalm 23, 6, David wasn't talking about being followed by someone or something that was dangerous that would harm him. No, he was talking with real confidence that he was being relentlessly followed by the goodness and love of the Lord. Now we know today that though he wouldn't have understand it. Any time in the Old Testament you see the word Lord in all capitals, that's really the pre-incarnate Jesus. That's why we say that he is the good shepherd, as he wrote, told us in John chapter 10. As David wrote about being followed by the Lord's goodness and love, he may have thought of those times when, as king, he led his army into battle. He had great confidence because he knew right behind him was this vast army of brave, experienced, and loyal soldiers. They had his back. They were right behind him. They would never let harm come to him. Or maybe he remembered his own experience as a shepherd. When he knew he would protect his sheep, he followed them. And if there was any sense or sight of danger, he would reach for the slingshot, pull it out of his belt, or perhaps take the club that was in his hand, and he would fight to the death to protect them. He was following his sheep, and that made them have comfort and a sense of real peace. What does it mean to be followed by the Lord's goodness? Oh, well, we know what badness is, don't we? Badness is something evil, something that will hurt us or hurt us or hurt others. But David is being followed by the Lord's goodness. Whatever he faced, he knew that God's goodness was watching over him, guaranteeing that nothing would get to him which would not ultimately be for his good. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything that happened to David was good. Certainly not. Many horribly painful and hurtful things happened. But he knew that his Lord, who, who was following him with his goodness, his Lord would mix everything together, and when he was done, it would ultimately be for David's good. Imagine setting down to a meal of raw eggs sprinkled with dry flour. Sound good? Not to me. <laughs> but of course, if you took those raw eggs and the right measurement of dry flour and mixed in some other ingredients and then baked them in the oven, wow, the butter-melting bread, the mouth-watering cookies, or the sweetly frosted cake is the product of taking things that weren't necessarily good in themselves, but mixing it together and applying the heat, and what was produced was wonderfully good. Does that make you think of Romans 8.28? 
where Paul wrote, we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Another translation talks about God working all things together for the good of those who love him. You see, it may be that God lets things happen to us that in and of themselves, individually, they're not good. They can be very, very bad. But God's goodness is following. And when it's all mixed together, when we can see life looking back, David was sure that he would be able to say, it was God's goodness that followed and protected me. But it was not only God's goodness that relentlessly followed or even chased David wherever he went. It was also his love. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I was interested to discover that different translations of the Bible in English translate that word differently. The familiar King James translation says, Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me. Whereas the New International that I'm using says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me. The New American Standard puts it this way, Surely your, good, surely your goodness and loving kindness will follow me. And uh, the New Living Translation says it like this, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will will follow me. Well, why do these translations use different terminology? Why, why don't they all get it together and translate it the same way? Well, the fact is that the strange sounding Hebrew word that David used, chesed, we'll just call it hesed in English, it's a little easier. Hesed is one of those foreign language words that's impossible to translate with just one word and get the fullness of the meaning. This word hesed or chesed is used almost 250 times in the Old Testament. It's a key Old Testament word, not always translated the same way. One Bible scholar wrote a whole book just about this one word in the Bible. And he said, it's the most important word in all the Bible. Well, whether or not we agree that it's the most important, it certainly is a very important word. Hesed, you see, describes God's character. It's God's grace, his mercy, his kindness, his compassion, his faithfulness, his justice, and his love, all packed together in one word, hesed. It is a an attempt to package the heart of God, who God really is at his core, with just three Hebrew letters. Probably the closest the New Testament comes to this same concept is in 1 John chapter 4, where we simply read, God is love. Well, we know in the Old Testament, God is hesed. Hesed is that characteristic that sets God apart from every other so-called God in all history, in all the universe. He's different from them all. Hesed is God's covenant love, his relational love. It is his unconditional commitment to deal with his people, not according to what they deserve, but to deal with his people according to his loyal, unfailing, no matter what compassion, his mercy, his kindness, and love. It's almost like irrational love, or as one writer said, crazy love. I think maybe the best translation, at least for me, of this word hesed is relentless love. Surely your goodness and relentless love will follow me all the days of my life. And did you catch David's certainty? This isn't in doubt. This isn't I hope. He says, surely. I have confidence. I know this absolutely. It is absolutely true that God's goodness and relentless love will pursue, will follow me all the days of my life. David knew that God's goodness and his relentless love were like two bloodhounds who would never lose his scent, never stop following him, no matter where he went. God's goodness and relentless love followed him like two fierce bodyguards. 
who never took their eyes off of you, him in order to keep him safe from anything that might be dangerous. God's goodness and relentless love were always right behind David, like the protective shepherd who walked behind his sheep, sling and club in hand, ready to protect them against anything. Even when David couldn't see them or feel them, even when he didn't knew he didn't deserve them, he was absolutely certain that God's goodness and relentless love had his back. They were following him. When? All the days of his life. You know, our life is broken down into days. Some of them are good days, aren't they? And some of them are bad days, aren't they? And some of them are really good days, and some are really bad days. But even in those days, even in the worst days, God's goodness and his relentless love are constant. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and the next day, all the days of his life, David was absolutely confident, as you and I can be if we are following the shepherd, that his goodness and relentless love will follow us all the days of our life. You can count on it. By the way, if you listened or watched the sermon from last week and we looked at Psalm 23, 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. We learned last week that in this psalm, if we're going to be like Jesus, the good shepherd, then we have to be like he is in this psalm. After all, that's God's goal in the Christian life, that we become like Jesus. And Psalm 23 tells us what the Lord, what Jesus is really like. From verse 5, we learn that if we're going to follow Jesus' example, be like him, then we need to be generous in helping the needy. He prepares a table before us. We need to be courageous in protecting the vulnerable. He does this in the presence of our enemies. We need to be like him in that we are compassionate to the hurting. You anoint my head with oil. And being extravagant in encouraging the downcast, my cup overflows. But now in this first half of Psalm 23, 6, if we want to be like Jesus, the good shepherd, then we must constantly pursue the people in our lives with goodness and relentless love, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done or not done, no matter how they treat us, no matter whether they like us or we like them, and no matter whether they're our friends or our enemies, whether or not they deserve it, uh, deserve it if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to constantly pursue those people with goodness and relentless love. You know, Christians ought to be known. It ought to be our reputation that we are people who are good to everybody. And we are good, who, we are people who show relentless love to everybody, not just our own, but to everybody. And that goodness and relentless love should show in our attitudes, in our words, and in our actions. Goodness and relentless love should permeate and characterize all of our relationships and interactions with other people. Jesus, you remember in Matthew 5, commanded his, his children, he said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. Following someone with goodness translates into doing good works for them. Uh, Paul wrote a letter to first century Christians who were living in Galatia, and he said to them, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. When Paul wrote to his young pastor friend Timothy, he told him that he needed to command the people in his church to do good, to be rich in good deeds to be generous and willing to share. You see, this is an emphasis throughout the Holy Scriptures that God's people are to pursue others with goodness, good deeds, doing things that don't harm people, but rather that help them, that benefit them, that meet their needs. To show people relentless love 
is to be willing to sacrifice yourself, to sacrifice and give up what you have, your agenda, your possessions, your time, your plans, to be willing to sacrifice in order to do what is absolutely best for them, what will ultimately be good for them. Centuries before Jesus came, the prophet Micah, in a very familiar verse to many people, wrote this, God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to show mercy. Guess what the Hebrew word is? It's chesed. It's hesed. Relentless love. This is what God expects of you, the prophet said. To uh, act justly and to love hesed. Relentless love. If we want to be like Jesus, we must actively, intentionally, and relentlessly look for ways that we can do good and relentlessly love the people that God brings into our lives. I can almost guarantee that sometime today, you're going to run into someone, see someone online, get a phone call from someone, have someone else mention them to us, or they'll pop into your brain someone who needs your goodness and your relentless love. Actually, you may already be thinking of someone, maybe someone you don't like, maybe someone who really bugs you or bothers you, maybe someone who doesn't treat you well, and they're in your mind right now. And you need to realize that God is calling on you to follow, to relentlessly pursue them with goodness and relentless love just like Jesus, the Good Shepherd, relentlessly loves and does good for us. And remember, if you believe in Jesus who died for your sins and rose from the dead, if you're committed to doing your best to follow Jesus, his teaching as an example, then you can be absolutely certain, no matter what's happening in your life, that Jesus' goodness and relentless love are following you every day, all the days of your life. Believe on, believe it. Count on it. Uh, find comfort in it. Rest in it. And share it with others. Surely your goodness and relentless love will pursue, will follow me all the days of my life. Thanks for listening.